Actually, I called my talk Milestones on My Yellow Brick Road. <coughs> I'm not going to talk about every brick on the road, <coughs> but I am just going to point at the various milestones. And you'll see that those of you that have the, the chart, I'm not going to talk about the chart. That is there to give you a familiar framework for the things that I'm going to, to talk about. And you'll see on the, the right-hand column the milestones are numbered. Uh, if there's time, we'll get to them all. If there isn't time, we won't get to them all. So you just have to make them up. <coughs> Usually in these things, people are asked to talk about how did you become a Quaker and what do you like about being Quaker and all that sort of thing. Well, I can answer that question in about five seconds flat. So what am I going to talk about for the rest of the time? I thought it might be interesting to explore, in a sense, my spiritual journey. Now that's a terrific idea, except that I don't understand what spiritual means. So it's a little bit difficult. What I'm going to talk about, perhaps under that rubric, are three threads. Being led, which is very Quakerly sort of a thing. Dealing with various crises, the moral aspects of those crises, and living with integrity. So, <coughs> first milestone. Following um, Gerald Hoffner, who a well-known Quaker comedian, among other things, married to, or was married to, a friend of uh, in uh, what used to be called Hampstead Monthly Meeting, Gerald Hoffner, who you may know of. He said that he was born at a very young age, and I can echo that. I was born in Sussex uh, of a, uh, a Quaker family. So there you have it. I told you, five seconds, less than five seconds. Um, I was born male, uh, white, Anglo-Saxon, heterosexual, um, and all sorts of other things. I was born in wartime. And all those are things which I had no control over. So I was led to be those things. The next milestone that I've put on the list is living in a probation hostel in South London. My father had, been, uh, 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 had finished his conscientious objection service uh, and the family came back together uh, in this uh, uh, probation hostel. And about that time, I was doing all my usual, all the usual naughty boy sorts of stuff that one, well, boys in particular, I don't know what girls get up to, but what, what boys do. Um, and I was very much, as one is, led by one's parents. And I got into serious trouble with them from time to time, again, as one does. But there were two things that I learned that were quite important. I learned that because I was the child of the wardens, um, I would hear things that I should not repeat to the boys. And because I was around the boys, I should hear, I hear, heard and saw things that I should not repeat um, to the staff. So I learned very early on about confidentiality and keeping confidentiality. Uh, and that's something that is pretty fundamental for me. I also learned about what one might call responsibility and commitment throughout that period, that childhood period, I had a, a lot of animals to look after successively. I had goldfish, I had budgerigars, hamsters, all sorts of things. And I learned that one has to, when you're committed to looking after an animal, you, you have to f follow that through. My next um, milestone was uh, at Saffron Walden. Now, through no um, no efforts of my own, I passed the 11 plus and I was given the choice of going to Sibford or to Saffron Walden. And I chose Saffron Walden on the grounds that the rest of my family had all gone to, to, to Sibford and I didn't want to go to Sibford so I went to Saffron Walden. That was my option. One of the first things that I learned there was that given the choice I will avoid physical hurt and punishment. At that time, uh, when we were in the first year, um, 
corporal punishment was still the order of the day. And we were given, you know, when you transgressed the rules, uh, you had the option of being slippered or doing half an hour writing in punishment. I always opted for the punishment. And that got me into some, in a sense, moral uh, difficulties because I felt I was being a coward. Um, on the other hand, it made sense. Why should you go and get hurt if you didn't have to? So, much more important, perhaps, um, I went on a, a French exchange at a Paris summer school and stayed with a French family for a while. And that taught me, or gave me, a very strong prejudice against the French. <laughs> um, that comes back to haunt us a bit later on. Right at the end of my time at Saffron Walden, my last year, I think, I went to, uh, for what reason I don't know, but I, I found myself drifting into um, a public lecture at which um, I saw there were films were shown of what was happening, or what had happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those films could not be shown today because of protection of children and all this sort of stuff. They were horrific. And I went back to, to, to school and I wrote a letter to my um, meeting, to my parents, um, at which I said, this is terrible stuff, it really must not happen again, um, except that my language was much stronger than that. And you can find that letter in The Friend. So that was my first exercise of, first of all, writing under concern, and secondly, of being a published author. <laughs> so you, you say it's there, you can find it if you wish. Um, quite important, again, I felt I was led to that. It was something I was driven to do. It wasn't something I chose. It just had to be done. And this thing about um, choosing is, is quite important. I left school and did various other things, and I reached a point when I was at a uh, Westminster meeting of wondering whether I was a proper person, what I was doing here, what it was all about. And I went around various um, religions, Buddhists, Rosicrucian, they're the ones I remember. Um, and I came to the conclusion that um, most of these great religions were all talking about very much the same sort of thing. Um, I wanted a reason for living and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I thought, well, if they're all the same, I might as well be Christian and, and put up with it. Um, and if I'm going to be Christian, why should I go and learn all these other strange sects? I might as well just be Quaker. So I decided, and it's a d deliberate decision which I can remember making, that I was going to be a Quaker. And the thing, the two things which really hit home with me was that it gave me a reason for living but it also the idea of living your beliefs, of, of holding, of having some sort of integrity in your life was important. That seemed to me to make sense. So that was a deliberate choice. It was a crisis, if you like, but I, I made a very deliberate choice. Um, a little bit later, um, I was actually at Woodbrook at the, at the time, and my wondering what to do with the, the rest of my life, what, what should I be doing? I, I didn't want to continue doing temporary office work or whatever, and the, the girlfriend at the time said, well, why don't you go teaching? Well, she was a teacher, so obviously she'd say things like that, wouldn't she? Um, but the upshot of that was that within a few weeks, I was in teacher training college. That was not any sense of vocation, of dedication on my part. It was scarcely even a choice, but looking back, I think it was very definitely led, otherwise it would not have happened that quickly. Um, all that easily. Um, I did get to go to the Cheltenham Ladies College, but only for an interview. <coughs> okay, my time at Coventry was great fun. We don't need to go into that uh, for, for this purpose. Um, but at the end, having completed my uh, teacher training, I went off on a hitchhiking tour um, around Greece and Italy. Again, that's a story in itself, but the upshot of that was that I found on a couple of occasions, particularly in Italy, that I was hitchhiking and I would be picked up by somebody who 
then molested me. I was not abused, <coughs> but it left me with a very strong prejudice against homosexuals and homosexuality. And I fairly quickly learned that if I get touched, my reaction is just to hit back. It's a gut level, automatic, that's what I do. And I've had to learn to deal with that. So, <clears throat> I was already very interested in psychology. In fact, I'd wanted to, to read psychology instead of going to teach a training college. Um, <clears throat> but having taught for a year um, and learned that, yes, uh, I'd been led into teaching, but actually teaching particularly younger children is a door that's closed to me. So, you lead, you test that leading, and sometimes you find that that's not quite what you thought it was. It's not the leading that you expected, and that was certainly true of, of, of teaching. But the way then opened up for me to go to Aberdeen and to, to read psychology. Um, so I was testing there that leading by going to university, going through the, the exercises of filling out the forms and attending and all the, lect the lectures and stuff like that. And that led... Um, led me to, to go to Carnegie Mellon University in the States. The idea at that time, having thought, well, now, okay, I'm, I'm qualified, I've got my degree, now what do I do with it? Um, and I was sort of thinking, I had already thought that maybe I wanted to be a, a clinical psychologist and, and help all these sad, sick people, uh, until I saw my fellow students who wanted to go down that route and decided that I really didn't want to be that crazy. So I didn't go down that route. I went instead to, to think about, well, I'd like to do research into physiology and so on and so forth. Off I went to Carnegie Mellon, and so I did those good things. Now, I was, that whole process can be thought of, with hindsight, as testing that leading into psychology. Academic, research, um, theoretical, human behavior stuff. But very quickly, um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I met one of my, uh, another student on the doctoral program called Reuben Brooks, who was ahead of me, uh, also a member of the meeting, and he invited me with one or two other people to join um, something called the Pittsburgh Quaker Community. That turned out to be extremely important to me because it gave me the experience of living in an intentional community with the intensity that that involves and living in a practical day-to-day -day sense one's Quakerism. We were all Quakers members of the meeting. Uh, some were in membership, some were not. We were mostly younger people at that time but the community itself from the original eight people grew and expanded uh, over some 20 years and, and so on and so forth. So that was a very important exercise in an experience of living with deep integrity. Another thing that happened there was that the people in the community ganged up and um, the result was that Trish and I got married. You could also say in a sense that okay I chose because I was the idiot that said will you marry me um, but on the other hand uh, I think it was also led uh, if I hadn't been there, if I hadn't been led to be in uh, Pittsburgh, to, led to be in the uh, Pittsburgh Quaker community, and if the people around didn't, hadn't thought that we would make a good couple, uh, then it, it would never have happened. So definitely led an element of choice, but yeah. One of the interesting things there is that we, because I was a foreigner, um, the meeting decided that, as, as it, w it was its standard practice, to have a, a clearness committee. You know, are you clear to, uh, to get married? Um, the committee didn't waste much time with that. They got on with the business of actually organizing the wedding. Um, and the other interesting thing is that of the, the, there were six couples, uh, uh, the two of us, three other couples, only two of those couples are still together. We're one of them. Um, so, uh, that precipitated several things. I found myself with a wife and three kids overnight almost um, to look after that were my responsibility. Um, and it seemed fairly obvious to me that um, 
the life of a graduate student is really not appropriate for, for that sort of commitment. Um, research grants, even in those days, were very uncertain um, and were not, didn't produce a level of income suitable for, for that level of, of responsibility. So um, I was introduced for the, perhaps for the first time to the notion of, of sacrifice and I gave up my career in research and psychology to support the family, which then left me with another question, well, how are you going to do this? And I did consult my Quaker background uh, in my head, not in, not in person, um, and came to the conclusion that if I was going to be Quaker, then what Quakers do, a lot of what Quakers do, is they're active in the sphere of politics. I'd, I'd met Quaker politicians and so on and so forth. But I felt that I did not have the skills, the insight, personality for that matter, to go into politics. It just didn't feel right. Um, and therefore I opted for the, the other choice that I saw as going into business. Um, commercial business uh, rather than charitable business. So I did that. My first business um, was, again, testing that, that leading, that, that choice, um, was to um, uh, an Amway business, which Amway sells soap in party plans. And by this time we were in Milton Keynes where everything was new and bright and bubbly and exciting. And uh, I discovered that I was being pressured um, to make up my numbers in order to get into the next category of, of remuneration and so on. And I was increasingly uncomfortable with this. Um, and the lesson there was that yes, okay, business, but not high pressure salesmanship, not um, that sort of, uh, of way of doing a, a way of doing business. I felt it was unethical and uh, inappropriate. So I continued with my by then software development um, career, and that led me um, eventually uh, to um, to overseas containers and into a political situation which I didn't recognise. So clearly I was right not to have gone into politics. Um, and I decided that I was not going to be bullied. I'd already decided that at Saffron Walden, but I was not going to be bullied. And I left in my own good time. And I went out to Saudi. Um, again, in itself a valuable experience, a huge career change. But in terms of my yellow brick road, if you like, the important experience was to see how the Saudis treated their, um, the other people that were in, in their country with them. Um, I was privileged because with the Americans and the, uh, the British are at the top of the tree. The top of the tree is, are you Saudi and Muslim? Are you not Saudi but still Muslim? And then the Westerners that were there to help with their technology and so on. And then there were a whole raft of other people lower down the social scale and some of those people were treated extremely badly in those days whether it's any better or worse I have no means of knowing now but the way that they were herded particularly the the Filipino nurses and um, uh, uh, cleaners around in buses and I was I actually witnessed um, the Saudi mullahs uh, um, caning women in the streets and I thought this is not right so I now have a third prejudice, which is against the Saudis. Saudis. Saudi is a wonderful country, beautiful place. It's a shame about the people. I came back from Saudi and started to work for Logica. Um, but it wasn't just Logica. It was Logica, Space and Defense. The defense put me into a situation where I had to say openly and decisively that I was not going to work on armaments. And the result of that was that my boss headed me off uh, into the direction of space and I had a, a happy year trocking around Europe working on the European Space Station. <coughs> but 
the interesting part there was that having done that, because Maggie pulled us out of the space race, um, I was put onto a project where I knew nothing about reliability, but Logica had won um, a, a contract to do research on software reliability, and they put together a, um, a group of people who had um, international reputation uh, international reputations, academic qualifications in various aspects of, of, of reliability and, and software reliability, but they hated each other's guts. And I was in there as completely the new boy on the block, knowing, not knowing which way was up, uh, and uh, the, I was working with these people in, in conflict with each other to make the project work, uh, which we did, not entirely my, my, my uh, through my efforts, but certainly in part through that. Um, when my, the, the department that I was with in Logica was being closed down and I was being pulled off, the rest of the team wanted me to continue, but that, that wasn't possible. Okay, so moving on a bit, um, we're now up to um, um, milestone 15. Um, I had by this time joined um, reliability consultants uh, down on the south coast. Um, and I was beginning to make a name for myself in as a software reliability person um, and to some extent not quite the software reliability person to go to person but very close to it um, but they uh, in their wisdom decided I was redundant and this was about the third time that I'd been made redundant by the, uh, by now um, and it was very clear to me at this time that uh, it was money where your mouth is time um, I'd been talking about and thinking about business, starting up a business, what you do to run it, etc., etc., management, leadership, all that stuff. But it was at very much arm's length. I'd been working in business for businesses, not running my own business. So within three days, within half an hour, I was out of the, of the building, and uh, within three days, I'd set up what became Khan Consultants. And the whole idea here, as far as I was concerned, was I did not want to be in business if I couldn't run a profitable business with integrity, with honesty, as a Quaker. And I've seen no reason to back off from that, that requirement. But it did fairly quickly throw me into another difficult situation. Um, I came up with the idea that it might be a good idea to be able to, to predict how much um, a piece of software was going to cost you over its lifetime. You knew what it was going to cost you to buy. In those days we didn't have internet and renting, so you, you bought the software. But then, in some cases, it could be lasting for a year, 10 years, 20 years. I've, I've worked with, with systems that have been already running for, for 30 or 40 years. So what is it actually going to cost you over that time? What does it cost to maintain, to make changes? And the funding for that, well, it was, uh, yeah, the funding for that came from uh, ultimately from the Ministry of Defence, the MOD, because they have some of the longest running software systems, uh, uh, certainly in the industry, um, probably in the world. Um, and they wanted to know what this, this cost was, so they funded the research, but they were not my client. RCL was my client. And this presented, I mean, I'm sure many Quakers would say, well, you should never have anything to do with the MOD. Um, and there was certainly a, a case for that, but um, I had to live. I still had a family to look after, um, and they were the only people that were prepared to, to, to fund this. Um, but I was not working directly on armaments or on things that were uh, part of armaments or contributing to armaments. The, the idea of maintaining software over its lifetime applies regardless. So. Um, with some reservations, as you hear, uh, I went down that particular route. Um, in the course of that, I became the person to go to worldwide for software maintenance and software lifetime costing. And I found that quite scary. Um, at that time, I don't think I was um, morally strong enough to, to hang on to it, and for various reasons, I, I drifted out of that. And where I drifted was into management consultancy um, because I have been working with fairly senior levels in various sorts of companies and so on. It seemed right, maybe I was being led here, 
um, to, to move into management consultancy. Again, my own business, but this time a limited uh, liability company. And I found that I was encountering on a fairly frequent basis very difficult situations. I was pitched, first of all, into a situation where uh, because of a failure of software, a whole company was falling apart. It was losing millions a week. Um, and my job was to go in and not put the company back together, but enable the company to be put back together by getting the uh, IT department to work uh, and by doing all the sorts of things which um, needed to be done to, to, to get people to work back together again. At the time, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was just being a Quaker. I was talking to people. I was not allowing their position in the company, their other experience, their authority, and, and so on, um, to phase me, because as Quakers, we, we don't accept all these hierarchical social structures. Um, I treated everybody as, 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 as equals and they, they could talk to each other. How do you, you know, what can you do to make this situation better and all that stuff. So that was a very important step forward. Similar thing happened at another company, a uh, Dutch state mining company. I was uh, there commuting every week across to Maastricht. And again, that project, it was a worldwide project, they're rolling out a huge system that had not been thought through properly. They were trying to, to, do, to combine two technologies that were fundamentally incompatible and nobody had the guts to tell the client, except me. So I did. And that's another story that, of, of, that, again, we can get into another time. So they were very important things. The third major exercise in management consulting, consultancy was that I had an assignment with um, Glaxo Welcome and the job was to um, sign off uh, servers as being um, fit for purpose. The, the fit for purpose is a one-line requirement by the um, Food Standards Agency, um, but it's the way the industry satisfies that requirement as far as software is concerned is to show that the server has been built correctly. That does not show that the server is fit for its purpose. Let me illustrate that very quickly. You can, I could certify that a screwdriver had been built correctly, it matched its specification, it had been built properly, it was within tolerance, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's a, it's a nice traditional um, carpenter screwdriver with a nice chisel edge. That is not, that is fit for purpose for doing screwing and unscrewing traditional slot headed screws. It is not fit for purpose for crosshead screws, or nor is it fit for purpose to hold the door open while you take it off its hinges. So that's the difference. And that idea was not around, was not acceptable to the people that I was working with. The result was that I blew the whistle on what they were doing. I said, I can't sign that. I can't sign that it's fit for purpose when I know it, it, that, that's not what I've, I've ascertained. There are ways of doing that, but not this way. And the people I was working with wouldn't talk to me anymore. My contract was terminated. Um, right. Now, around this, this sort of time, we're on to now 17. Am I doing? Am I okay for time? Yeah. Close. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, about this time, I was thinking very much about Quakerism and, and, and business and so on. And with a friend from um, uh, Finchley meeting, where I was at that time, uh, a group of us got together and started the Quakerism business group with the idea of taking business Quaker principles out into the commercial business world. Um, and that led fairly quickly to writing um, Good Business Ethics at Work, which is the, what I did was to take the advices and queries and rewrite them in, in business terms. What, does, what do those advices and queries translate into in business contexts? And this was a very, again, a very, um, very much a, a, a driven situation. I was it was an idea, I was led to do it, but then I was driven. Having accepted the, the, the leading, I was absolutely driven. It was just, you know, 
it, it fills your whole mind and you do it until it's finished and then you, you wonder what to do next. Um, I also at that time had a, another clearness committee to say well is this the right direction for me to go? This is what a clearness committee is about. Um, should I be working with businesses, not just working in business, but should I be working with businesses trying to, to improve them in some way? And the answer came back a very clear yes. It also led me to Old Jordan's, which was a horrendous experience. Um, it again validated that I, I'm not the right person to, to do political things. Um, but I ended up by saying in public that I was, uh, it was all my fault and my responsibility when it wasn't necessarily. Um, and that was very difficult to cope with. Um, I'm going to skip a bit, I think, down to... Oh, no, maybe briefly I can mention the, the Friends Quarterly Competition, which is Milestone 19, um, where I, wrote a, I entered the uh, competition um, to write an essay on the future of Quakerism, which I did, knowing that I was not eligible for the prize because Trish was working for the friend. Um, I did that exercise. I built a whole website, which is still out there if you really want to go and look at it. And my conclusion was to see Quakers, not just me, but everybody, as a catalyst. It's not just our job to go and, and change the world, it's to help other people change themselves and, cha and thereby change the world, which is a, a very different approach. Um, if you want to understand that a little bit better, an article of mine called Being There was published in The Friend a year, 18 months ago, about a year ago I think, something like that, but it's there, you can look at it. So, um, one other thing, Milestone 20, is in uh, 2014, we began the um, World War I commemoration exercise, and Sheila Gatiss that we heard of this morning was, was very active in that, and got me involved in it to some extent, but I really had some deep um, reservations, and the reservations crystallized around the idea that here we are, busily protesting, politically active, and all that stuff, but for the last 2,000 years, it's not done a lot of good. Um, we still are violent, warlike people across the world, not just in, in Britain. Um, but looking at the, the peace testimony, there's the, the little bit that says, living in a way that takes away the occasion for all wars. Now, remember, I'd lived in Qua Pittsburgh Quaker community, which was just, su just such a, a community, just that sort of living that way. And it occurred to me that what we would need is not protest, not just protest, and we still need protest, but we don't need not just protest. We need to present an alternative. How are you going to live without lots of violence, lots of war, and so on? And in a lot of ways, I'm still grappling with that issue. Um, I think you may or may not agree with me, but I think the solution to that is actually to teach people how to use the Quaker business method and use it properly. Okay, so there we are. Um, there are a lot of things that the, where the jury is still out. Um, questions like, um, how do you combat bullying? I've mentioned bullying a number of times. Um, is the challenge that I'm facing in, in my filmmaking group um, a, a milestone? How to get people working together on a film? It's a whole different thing from working in business. Um, is working with the premises committee going to turn out to be a milestone? I don't know. Is the course that I'm on, the Soul of Leadership course, which is taking me really deeply into myself and other people, is that also going to be turn out to be a milestone? Is my company that I'm trying to start, face-to-face -face behavior enhancement. Is that a milestone? I don't know. End of yellow, well, no. The end of the, the yellow brick road has not come to an end because I haven't reached the end of it yet. <coughs> so, um, work in progress, friends. Thank you.
to talk about the kind of things that one usually only learns at a person's funeral. <laughs> well, you haven't learned anything because it's not my funeral yet. <laughs> Sorry? Peter. Peter is our eldest son. We have, well, when I married Trish, which he came with Wendry, Wendy, she was then, now Wendry, Peter, and Jeremy. Um, and we added Amanda and Susanna. And then in 2010, uh, Peter went to sleep and didn't bother waking up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, my first question, Sharon, is something that my first instinct was to ask, ask which form I remember having to be What about that letter that you wrote? Um, so it's in the frame. When I, was, when I, when I became a Quaker, I, I was almost three years electronic membership and I don't know why. Um, so, are, are you able to locate? In 19, 1959, I think it was, was published. Yeah. That's all right. I was only nine years old then. How old were you? Oh, older than that. It was my last year at, at Saffron Walden, so it would be 59. I would have been, yeah, 15, 16. A number of friends in Pittsburgh meeting put part of their retirement funds together um, and they bought uh, a house on North Homewood Avenue in Pittsburgh which is off Forbes Avenue um, <coughs> and eight of us moved in. Um, at that time they were all single although some dragged a what we would now call a partner along with them. <coughs> um, one had been married and was divorced. Um, <coughs> it, was a Quaker, it was a vegetarian community. It was right on the corner of um, North Homewood and uh, Mead Street, um, <coughs> which it turned out was uh, behind us further down North Homewood was a black ghetto. And on the other side of um, Forbes Avenue was a, um, a, a long-standing, very rich uh, Jewish community. Um, we were, oh, well, single people, so we, we lived in the house, but we went out and did other things. I was a graduate student at the Univer at Carnegie Mellon University. Somebody else was a trained teacher, but was a, uh, um, a, a ran a, a, a disc jockey radio program. Um, one was um, a lawyer, two were at Pitt University, uh, and, and so on. We, we lived and worked, you know, in, in, uh, as that community uh, together. We held um, potlucks every Wednesday, and those were amazing ex uh, exercises. Um, in the summer we would spill out onto the streets because other people that were not living in the street came along as well. Um, we ran a, uh, um, uh, what was it called, a, a sort of farmer's market thing. The two or three of us would get up, often not me, would get, get up early in the morning, one morning in the week, go into the farmer's market and buy fresh fruit and vegetables and cheese, bring it back, divide it up, price it up, and then offer it to the, to the neighborhood. So we were doing this. Um, it turned out that the house next door along Mead Street was a Mennonite house. So we, the Mennonites and Quakers are quite close together in many ways. And then a bit further down there were Buddhists and, and so on. And we, when Trish and I got married, we bought another house with the community on Mead Street. Um, and we were the, the white house on the black... We were the white family on a black street. And the other end of Mead Street, there was another house that was a black family on a white street. Um, so it was, you know, what made it, 
particular, well, it was very intense because we were all Quaker, we were being Quakers together, we were doing thing, we were doing the things that we were doing because we were Quaker, because we, we cared about our community. Um, we would hold, hold our own, uh, our business meetings were, were Quaker business meetings in effect. Um, I don't know, it, it's a feeling like nothing else. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? I did indeed. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, one of the themes that I didn't pick up is that I, I have um, a tendency to um, uh, to break rules if I don't agree with them. And I started that at, at, at Saffron Walden, and, and I certainly did that out in Saudi. Um, because uh, a small group of us would go out driving in um, four-wheel drive vehicles out into the desert, which was highly illegal um, because you're not supposed, well, we weren't supposed to travel without uh, official documents. We were traveling with, um, in a mixed party, there were women in the party, and we would take homemade booze out with us. So, I mean, <laughs> No, there was nothing outside that said we were, were, were a Quaker community. No, it was just you know a house and an address. Yeah. Doing things that were Um, probably the management consultancy. Um, it was extreme. It was more challenging, but it, challenging on all sorts of fronts. It wasn't just intellectual challenge, which of course research is, and, and developing software was it was an intellectual challenge. But it was working with people in a way that that um, I'd never done before. Um, and helping them to do what they wanted to do. Now, I very carefully said there are a number of things that I'm doing at the moment where the jury is out, and those, because they're not finished, are also challenging. They, they have um, people, relationship, organizational management, Quaker challenges associated with them, um, not always, uh, sometimes missing the, the, the intellectual challenge. I mean, restoring furniture is, is creative, I suppose. Um, it has a certain satisfaction to it, but it doesn't have, as a as a, a, a person who restores furniture, it doesn't have the intellectual challenge that the the other things did. But in the management consultancy, I found all that coming together, and it was was really, it was satisfactory. It was exciting. It was stretched me, took me into places that I had not been in before. Um, and being Quaker was an essential part of dealing with those those situations because I was treating people as equals, as individuals, not simply as uh, pawns to be moved around on a chessboard. Um, I wasn't kowtowing to people who thought they were bosses or something and, and so on. And that gets me into a lot of trouble in, in, in hierarchical <laughs> situations. <laughs> 